So, hi and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for coming to my talk. Um, I'm Michael, I'm a security analyst for Mozero. And today I want to talk about uh, the flexibility that email addresses have to offer and how this can be used for offensive purposes. Um, I also brought a real world example um, to showcase that. So it's a case study that I have done together with my colleague Pascal Zenker, um, where we exploited a spam filter appliance. Um, yeah. So, but let's first start with a little bit of background. And let's talk about security appliances. So, um, security appliances are all around us, right? Um, we all have some of those uh, somewhere in our infrastructure, such as firewalls, VPN gateways, maybe even IDS, IPS, stuff like that. Um, and they're all great. They help us to protect our networks, right? Um, they help us to identify and mitigate attacks, threats. Um, however, there's also another side of that, because what all these appliances have in common is that they usually operate with uh, yeah, high privileges, and they're also highly trusted. I mean, they're security de devices, right? So, um, yeah. So, for example, let's take a firewall. If an attacker is able to compromise your firewall, um, he can access uh, private networks, intercept any traffic that flows over that firewall. So, in a way, these um, security appliances also create a wrong sense of security. Um, and they also have a long history of serious flaws. Uh, we don't even have to go too far back in time. I brought some recent, ex uh, recent examples. Um, I think the sponsors of this conference are not going to be very happy with me, but they're great examples, right? Um, so yeah, vulnerabilities in these products is also uh, nothing new. That's, uh, that's what we, we, we can say from that, right? So they should be regarded as um, high-value targets or high-value assets, depending on the side you're on. So in this talk, uh, I want to focus on spam filter appliances. And in this case, the very same principles apply. Um, if you think about how a spam filter works, you usually want to place it right in front of your mail server, right? So any message that is sent to you can be um, scanned and uh, classified or a filtered, so to get rid of viruses, malicious content. Um, so as attackers, once again, if we're we are able to compromise such a spam filter appliance, um, what can we do? Well, we can read all the emails. So that means if we think about how you reset your passwords for some web services, um, you head onto the web page and you press the password uh, reset button, and then you enter your email address, and the password reset link is sent to your mailbox. So guess what? We are in your spam filter, so we can read those emails, um, so we can basically take over accounts, right? Um, and then, I mean, obviously we also have a notable attack surface, so, I mean, emails can be sent to anyone. Uh, in a sense, it's, it can be regarded as unauthenticated, and um, the spam filter has to do some processing on that uh, unauthenticated message in order to classify that message. So attack surface is also given for us as attackers. And uh, I would also say it's often uh, overlooked, uh, just as discussed on the previous slides. I mean, it's a security product, so why should you audit it, right? Um, and now... Emails uh, or spam filters are especially interesting because, uh, as we found, uh, email parsing is hard. And why is that? Um, so let's talk a bit about email addresses or how they are constructed. Mm. Now, first of all, there are lots of different uh, RFCs around emailing in general. Um, so here I'm going to focus on, on two particular ones. So the internet message format and the SMTP one. 
Um, so yeah, there are many, but at the end of the day, it always depends on uh, the mail server you're, you're interacting with, right? Just because there's an RFC doesn't mean that they are all compliant to all these RFCs. Um, so basics first, we always have a local part and a domain part, which are separated by an ad. Pretty straightforward. So the first interesting um, concept here is that you can actually use comments in email addresses. I personally didn't know that before. So you can put those, uh, simply you can add a comment, uh, put some string into parentheses, and you can put that anywhere uh, in the email address, so both local and domain part. And you can also use pretty much any, any printable character, as you can see in the example. Um, so let's go a bit into detail about the domain part. Uh, this one isn't very interesting for us. Uh, as you can see, the character set is quite limited. So you can only use uh, letters, digits, hyphens, periods. Uh, one thing that is a bit special is that you can put IP addresses in the domain part, um, as you can see here. And those IP addresses may be surrounded by brackets. But nothing, nothing too crazy, nothing too interesting. The local part is much more interesting, however. So here we have um, two different main formats, let's say, on how you can uh, construct your email address. So there's an unquoted format and a quoted one. Um, and as you can see in the unquoted one, this is the one that we usually use. Um, we already have uh, quite a wide range of characters that are uh, considered valid. So, for example, you can use a dollar sign or curly braces, pipes, stuff like that. And then in the quoted one, um, which is, is essentially you just put your local part into double quotes, um, you can do even more stuff. So you can use white spaces, you can use tab characters, uh, so pretty much any, any character that you wish. Um, this obviously also includes the character set that is uh, supported by the, by the unquoted one. And then another notable point is that we have 64 characters to work with, which uh, gives us a lot of space, right? So, that you can get an idea of what this could look like, I brought some rather unusual email addresses, mm, but they are all perfectly uh, valid according to those RCs. Um, so what we conclude from that is that we have uh, plenty of characters to work with and uh, do some Fancy stuff. So let's uh, talk about some ideas what we as attackers can now do with that. So if we know the application that we're uh, interacting with does something, uh, you know, constructing SQL statements, we could think about putting an SQL injection into that because it's perfectly valid. We could also think about server-side template injection. Um, you know, if the address ends up in some template that is rendered. Um, or we could think about XSS. Turns out we're not the first ones to think about that. So this is an example from Hacker One, where someone basically put an XSS payload into the local part of an email address. And um, this email address was then rendered somewhere on the page and uh, the XSS triggered because no one thought about sanitizing the email address. So. Why should you? Um, another interesting concept that I want to talk about here is the uh, is sub addressing. Now, I think among technical people, this is uh, quite well known. But just to get everyone on the same page here, so sub addressing is also called uh, plus addressing, tag addressing, mail extensions, and it basically allows you to add arbitrary tags to your email address. Um, so, for example, if you want to have in your newsletters um, all in the same directory or folder in your inbox, you would add, whenever you sign up to some new newsletter, you would add a plus news tag, for example, to your email address. And uh, in your inbox, you would then create a rule that moves all the incoming messages with that given news tag to this uh, folder. So, it allows you for better filtering, sorting, management, um, of these, of your, of, of your inbox, basically. Um, it's also supported by most, by many, I would almost say by most mail, mailing providers uh, nowadays. 
which is great. And uh, the most interesting thing about that is that, uh, that it's absolutely dynamic. So that means uh, you do not have to configure these tags beforehand. You can really just go ahead, take your email address, like John plus arbitrary tag, and uh, the mail will end up in your in your inbox. A um, couple of ideas here, what we could do with that as attackers. So, for example, it might be possible to um, create some state inconsistencies in an application where you have multiple components that are handling the, uh, your email address. So imagine the first component where you enter the, the, the address uh, supports it and another doesn't. Uh, you might be able to screw up things, right? Um, maybe you're able to get some filter bypass working with that. And the most obvious one, you, you obviously can sign up multiple times with the same mailbox uh, to some web service. Um, now, I also have another example, but you will see that in the, in the case study. Um, talking about that, uh, let's take this into the real world. What can we do with that? Um, so, for this, we took the product, a product called Mail Cleaner as our case study. Um, so, it's a spam filter appliance, um, which is, uh, you know, you can use to counteract spam, malicious uh, messages, viruses, all that stuff that you don't want to, to receive. And there's a commercial and a community edition for Mail Cleaner. Uh, the source code is open source. It's on GitHub. That's uh, also how we found it. Um, and so how it works, so remember it's an appliance, that means it is shipped as a virtual machine image. Um, so you download this image and you deploy it on some hypervisor. Um, so it's not just a single piece of code, but it's, it's a whole machine. Um, and then it works like a reverse proxy, but for email. So what does that mean? You point your main MX record uh, of your domain to mail cleaner. So all the mails are sent to MailCleaner, and then uh, you configure some outgoing mail server on MailCleaner that uh, where the, the mails are, are forwarded once they're clean. Um, there's also a cluster setup available for larger organizations um, if you need uh, load balancing. So in this case, you would have multiple instances of MailCleaner, uh, which uh, would uh, take all the uh, processing. And then for us, particularly interesting is obviously the attack surface of that software. So what do we have there? We have a web interface that is written in PHP um, with an admi admin part and a user part. So the user part uh, can be used to configure mailbox-related stuff like email aliases, and the admin part allows you to configure the whole appliance, basically. Um, and then we have the, the main mailing port, the SMTP port, port 25, which is exposed through a modified version of Exim. Now, before we started looking at the code, we uh, fired up Shodan just to get an idea of how, how widely this product is used um, in the internet. As you can see, it was around 4K instances, so nothing too crazy, nothing too big. However, we found some uh, let's say interesting targets among these 4,000 instances. So uh, that you can uh, get an idea, I have some screenshots here that the vendor published, or it's on their website as references. So we have a couple of uh, interesting sectors, for example, uh, administration, a couple of ISPs, healthcare, financial, education as well. Um, and also some numbers, so that this is from another reseller that also published some references. Um, and we've even found some government using it, so we thought, well, it's interesting enough to, ha to have a look. So, but before diving into the technical part, I wanna briefly talk about a bit uh, about the, the research process. Uh, so once again, I think this is a quite well-known approach. That's also how we approach it. So let's go through it very quickly. Um, so first of all, what you want to do, want to do in, in, if you're uh, investigating such a software, uh, you want to identify dangerous sinks. Uh, for example, for a PHP application, these would be functions like system, eval, 
um, unserialize, file write, file read. So basically anything that interacts with the system in some way and processes variable data. Um, and what you do then is you try to find out whether you can uh, somehow tamper with this data. That's also why it's called taint analysis. Um, so it basically means, uh, yeah, you try to taint that data that ends up in these things. Um, you can do that also both ways. So you can start at the sink and kind of trace the data back where it came, uh, came from. Or you can start at the data source. So you would try to find out where can you enter data into a system and where does it flow. And yeah, try to find out if it, if it ends up in, in one of these uh, interesting things, right? Um, now what I personally like to do is, especially for apps like uh, Python or PHP apps where you can easily change up the code, um, I would go ahead and set up a local testing environment and then just start adding in log lines, which helps me uh, trace the data flow better. Um, yeah, it makes things a lot easier. It saves a lot of time um, compared to the to only a, a static analysis, right? So um, now, in this case, in our case study, um, we took the email address as a data source. So we said, we have an email address, we can send an email to this spam filter gateway. Um, let's try to find out where it ends up and what can we do with it, with also all the uh, theory that we now have uh, in mind. So let's get to the technical stuff. First of all, um, most obvious thing in mail cleaner is the web front end, I would say. As you can see here is a screenshot from the admin interface that lists all the mails that end up in spam. So it's the spam quarantine, it's called. So if we send an email to mail cleaner and it's, it's classified as spam, it will end up in this list. And here, um, well, we have three fields in this table. I hope you can see it. Um, which are attacker controlled, right? We have a recipient. We have a sender and we have a subject. So um, easy one, right? We just put an XSS into the subject field and we're done. However, that didn't work um, because it's sanitized. But you already guessed what's coming, right? With the sender, sender address, that's not the case. So we can put something like that into the sender address and we get our XSS. Um, now here, what was Particularly interesting about that is that the web, on, uh, web front end is often not exposed to the internet. So from all of these 4K instances, uh, most of them did not have this interface exposed because after all, it's a management interface, so it makes sense to not expose it. Um, however, since we're sending an email, um, we can still use this as an attack vector, right? So that's cool. Um, now, another thing that was quite cool about that is that we previously already found uh, an authenticated RCE in this uh, web front end. So uh, this XSS could be chained to an RCE, an unauthenticated RCE, basically. So you could send an email with an XSS payload that would trigger the authenticated RCE. So once an administrator would navigate to this page, the XSS would trigger uh, and the RCC would be RCE will be executed. So, however, what's, what's more interesting than the web stuff? So we wanted to find something that does not rely on web at all. I mean, it's still just an XSS and someone has to trigger it, right? So um, we started inspecting some backend code and we found a couple of cron jobs. So remember, it's an appliance. So we have a whole uh, image that contains all sorts of interesting stuff. So we found some cron jobs that um, basically do some uh, housekeeping stuff, let's say. And this one was particularly interesting. That's the clean spam, spam quarantine cron job. So let's walk through it. Um, here's how it looks. And I mean, if you have a look at that, you know, I guess you probably already see it, right? Down there, um, we have a, a call to system which executes OS commands and we have variable data that is processed, so it looks good to us. 
Um, I mean, we know if we, if we can get somehow our data into this variable, in this domain entry variable, we could execute uh, commands, right? So we do what we have discussed before. We trace this back. Where does this data come from? Uh, it comes from up there, line 84, um, which enumerates, uh, it's a call to read here, which enumerates uh, over some directory. So at this point, we can assume that whatever ends up in this variable is a file path. Now we would, could also assume it's a directory because it says rmd here. So, but be before further investigating, um, we thought, well, let's just um, send a spam mail to the appliance and see what happens. Because here we have some interaction with the file system, so um, it should, something should end up on the file system. So that's what we did. Um, we sent a mail using this um, Swax command line mail client, and we put some special string into the body, as you can see. That's a spam filter test string, so it's basically the same as ICAR for antivirus. Uh, it just tells the spam filter to bump up the spam score and you know, classify it as spam. Um, so yeah, we sent this mail, and we inspected the file system, and as you can see, the spam mail was actually stored on disk. So it's stored in some random looking file. However, what's more interesting is, is the, the directory that it is contained in. And as you can see, that's uh, named after the recipient email address. So investigating this a bit, bit further, we found that this is actually our domain entry variable, or at least that's what will end up in this variable when this cron job runs. So yeah, you might already guess where this is going. If we can control this uh, recipient and we're able to inject something there, our, uh, like some, some, if you can get some OS command injection going there, uh, yeah, we will be able to execute arbitrary commands, right? So we made up a little game plan. I mean, it looks straightforward. We send a spam mail to the appliance. This directory will be created containing our injection payload. Um, the cron job will be triggered at midnight. And then we have our RCE, simple as that. However, it turns out it wasn't quite that easy. We had a couple of constraints. So let's talk about them. Um, first of all, we know our um, address will end up in a directory. So that means we can only use characters which are allowed for a file name or directory. Um, so this one isn't too big of an issue <clears throat> because on Unix-based file systems, you can use pretty much any character, right, uh, except slash. So that shouldn't be an issue. However, there was another thing that was a bit uh, a bigger blocker, um, which is the address verification on the outgoing mail server. So what does that mean? Um, before MailCleaner does any sort of classification or processing of that message that arrives, it uh, calls up the outgoing mail server and asks, hey, do you know this recipient address? Are you willing to accept a mail for this recipient? And if it says no, um, the message is just discarded and nothing is written on disk. So that means we have to use a valid uh, recipient address that exists on the outgoing mail server. So there has to be a mailbox um, assigned to that address. So, but I mean, with the theory that we've seen on the, on, the, on the slides before, we know, well, we can just use sub-addressing for that, right? So the idea would be, we take a, a valid existing address, such as John, we add a plus sign, and then we can put our payload, and uh, we should be good to go. That should be perfectly valid. So and then the question is, I mean, we have seen in these RFCs the characters that we can use, which looked quite good. However, at this point, we don't know yet whether these mail servers are actually compliant with those RFCs and whether we can really leverage this whole character set. So let's talk about the character set. Uh, and here we could first think about, well, what do we even need or what would be good to have for our uh, final uh, payload? So we certainly need something to inject, uh, execute commands, such as backticks, dollar sign, parentheses. Um, we need something to chain commands or at least it would be useful. I mean, usually you want to execute multiple commands, maybe. Um, and then 
most importantly, we need white space because without white space, um, it's pretty hard to execute commands with, um, with arguments. So if you look at the usual reverse shell payload, right, not going to work without white space. So we started assessing the character set with uh, two references, which uh, consisting of Gmail and Outlook. Um, yeah, we, we started hitting those with some um, tests to assess the character set. The first thing we tried was the quoted address format because that would allow us um, to use uh, the, the widest range of characters, right? That would provide us with the most flexibility. Um, however, as you can see, that wasn't too successful. Um, both didn't accept it. One said unknown recipient, the other one access denied, whatever that means. Um, However, the, the character set looked quite good. So as you can see, most of the characters specified by the RFC were actually accepted. So that was great news. But we still didn't have white space. Because without the quoted format, we can't use white spaces directly. So without white space, no reverse shell. We had that. So we started trying out um, some common methods that you guys probably all know. So for example, the IFS one. Um, this didn't work because uh, the email address was always converted to lowercase. So we basically couldn't access any nth variable that is present on, in this environment. And we also tried this bash syntax. Didn't work either because we didn't have bash. Um, this uh, script was running inside the default shell on Debian, which is uh, dash. So didn't work. We also tried lots of encoding stuff, didn't work either, because there's simply no decoding going on uh, through this chain. So, but what we know or what we knew was that we can execute the commands that are present on the system, right, like df or uname, and we can store this output in some nth uh, variable, because that, that's something you can do without white space. And in these command outputs, you always have plenty of white space, so, it must be possible to um, kind of extract white space from there, right? So we did what you do in such cases. You, we started scrolling through the dash man page, um, trying to find something that was, would uh, help us there. And we find something that's called parameter expansion. Now, before I try to uh, explain this beautiful description, I think I'd rather go with an example. Um, so imagine we have this output, df, piped into tag to reverse the uh, line order. And we store that in an nth variable called output. And then we have this uh, expression down there, which is the parameter expansion expression. So where you can specify the nth variable first, which is output in our case. And then you can specify a pattern, which is asterisk d. And now what this expression does is it does uh, basically a, a a greedy prefix match on that given string. Um, so which means it matches up onto the very last D character in this string. So the D from mounted. And then it uh, purchases this whole section. And uh, what is left is a white space and the characters O and N. Now you might also realize why we have used this, uh, used tag to reverse the line order. So that ensures that the header of DF is always at the bottom. So you can use it uh, against any system, right? The other things would change. So now, um, at this point, it would certainly also be possible to get rid of the O and N. However, it turns out is not even necessary because now we can just use curl. So, um, we can put this expression straight after a curl command, which uh, puts outputs um, a white space, space O and N, and O and N is then just a part of a domain or subdomain that we control. So in this case, uh, we use it as a subdomain. So um, we fetch this remote um, payload using curl, and we pipe that into shell, and with that, we're able to execute any command that we wish. So with that, um, last restriction also out of the way. So let's get to the fun stuff. Now um, let's craft an exploit for that. So remember, this is uh, where we're coming from. We have this Perl script um, that with this uh, system call with the uh, domain entry 
variable that we can um, influence through this path that is constructed. So that, that's the path at the bottom and the very last piece of it, the recipient is the one that we control. Let's just keep that in mind to build um, this exploit. Then we have uh, our components that we're going to use. So we have a valid address um, using sub-addressing, we have a plus sign, and then the payload will come after that. Then we have our variable assignment with a DF tag um, output. We have our curl command, which fe fetches the reverse shell payload. And uh, yeah, we can chain anything together, everything together with uh, pipes or ampersand, because these are perfectly supported, right? Um, semicolon, uh, we couldn't use. Um, however, that's, that's good enough. So let's um, put this together. So as I just said, first of all, we have our email address, Chando, plus a couple of pipes. Now here we had to use three pipes because one of the pipes is eaten up by the Perl script for some weird reason. Um, then we put our n variable assignment, chain that with the curl command, with our parameter expansion expression that puts the byte space where it needs to be. Rest of the curl command, um, now there is no, also a cat that was needed. Couple of more pipes to terminate the co to command uh, properly. And then um, our domain. So that's it. Um, looks like a perfectly legitimate email address to me. Um, oh, and by the way, if you find a more elegant solution to that, uh, I'm, I'm very cu curious. Um, send it to us and uh, we, we can get you some swag. Um, so let's see that in action. I have a demo here. So um, very briefly at the top we have, uh, we will send a spam mail just as we had before. In the middle we have a shell on the mail cleaner instance where we will set the, the, um, the time to shortly before midnight to trigger the cron job so we don't have to sit here till midnight. And the bottom left is the reverse shell listener and bottom right is a Python web server that serves our um, reverse shell payload. So let's have a look. Mail is sent. The message has been classified as spam. So this is sped up a little bit. It actually takes quite a lot of time till it finally reaches that point in the code. And that's it, there's our shell. So yeah, uh, we also found a couple of other stuff. Um, if you're interested, you can have a look at the full report on our web website. So feel free to have a look. So let's wrap this up. Um, what are the key takeaways here? Um, first of all, these vulnerabilities are really nothing too crazy, right? It's, at the end of the day, it's just a basic um, command injection. However, it's a perfect and absolutely great example um, that a proper handling of email addresses is hard because they're just not as restrictive as one would think, right? And it's also a good example of how every component that you add to your infrastructure um, introduces new attack surface including security products. Um, so in this case, I mean, simply adding a spam filter, right? What could go wrong? Um, so I think the impact is really, is, is greatly underestimated. Um, and last but not least, I mean, security really has to be approached holistically. Uh, we should always consider the infrastructure as a whole because at the end of the, of the day, um, it's always the weakest linked accounts, right? That's all an attacker needs. So with that, thank you very much for having me.